Thank you everyone for joining us uh, today. It is actually great uh, for me to welcome you to our first deep dive on climate change adaptation, which is organized under the umbrella of the North American Marine Protected Areas Network or NAMPAM. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Parks Canada for the funding to make this possible and uh, to EcoAdapt uh, for all the work that goes behind the scenes to make this um, a reality for organizing and facilitating this, uh, this session. As Catherine said, I'm working for the United Nations Environment Program, also known as UNEP, uh, here in North America, based in Washington, D.C., uh, but covering the whole uh, North American region. And as part of our work, we are providing in the coordination of NAMPAM. Uh, we are working in close collaboration with the three countries, Canada, Mexico, and the United States, but also the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. And our objective is to foster a comprehensive network of marine protected areas in North America. Uh, just in case you don't know us, NAMPAN is what we call a virtual community of practice for MBA managers and experts. Our mission, is um, to create um, a strong and active network of people and places uh, at all levels, because what we want is to increase uh, knowledge and capacity in these marine protected areas. We aim to grow uh, collaboration, to better address uh, common issues and build partnerships for integrated conservation efforts. And as I said, our main objective is to identify key challenges and opportunities uh, so that we can share information and best practice and consider how uh, the North American uh, Marine Protected Areas Network or NAMPAM can actually serve your needs. And uh, we do this by connecting uh, marine protected area practitioners uh, for information and, and good practice. And with that objective in mind, this is why we're here today, to connect MPAs and climate change adaptation, which is one of the priority uh, topics that we identified in consultation with many, many of you. Um, actually, I'm looking at some of the names of the people that connected, and, and I see that some of you have already been part of previous deep dives that we have organized in the past. We were covering for the three first um, uh, iterations of this, the topic of ecological connectivity. And as I said today, we're moving forward uh, into a different topic. And today we will look at climate change adaptation strategies. Um, we really hope this provides a good uh, venue to discuss uh, this important uh, topic. So again, thank you so much for joining us and I wish you a very productive discussion. And over to you, Catherine, thank you. Thank you, Maria. Um, as Mayor Mar Maria mentioned, uh, today we will be taking a deep dive into the topics of climate change adaptation and marine protected areas. We'll begin this with a series of presentations from topic experts followed by breakout group discussions, and then finally reconvene all together to have a larger cross-group discussion. So now I would like to introduce our first speaker and moderator for today's event, Zachary Caniso. Zach is the climate coordinator for NOAA's Office of the National Marine Sanctuaries and National Marine Protected Areas Center where he promotes climate resilience and adaptation within national marine sanctuaries and other marine protected areas through the analysis and application of climate science and adaptation, resilience, mitigation techniques, as well as the production of tools and resources for MPA managers. His work also includes advancing the integration of natural and social sciences into science-based design and management of marine protected areas and the application of blue carbon and other nature-based solutions. I will now turn it over to Zach, who will provide us with an introduction of our topic today and introduce our other speakers. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you all for being here today and allowing me to speak. So I do want to take a little bit of time to set the stage for what we're going to be talking about today. And when we're thinking about trying to understand effective adaptation, one of the things I want to lay the groundwork for is 
working with and incorporating adaptation into our management and planning with intentionality and purpose. So that's really what I'm going to speak to today. I'm going to allow our other two speakers and our breakout groups to really dive into this topic of determining effective adaptation actions. And really what it comes down to is this quote here is a good starting place. Protected areas represent one of our most effective tools to adapt to climate change. That's both in the water and on land. <clears throat> but we also need to recognize that the climate is changing and we need to do things differently. The past is no longer a reliable predictor of the future. We can no longer rely on the traditional Western strategy of environmental stationarity and conservation management. It just isn't likely to be effective anymore. We can no longer take a look at what happened in the past, say, let's draw a line around a particular area, protect it from human influences, the natural influences will take care of themselves, and the area will be okay. We have to plan for a future that is no longer going to look like the past. And we have to recognize that that future is uncertain. And this is really where adaptation comes in. Critically, planning is in and of itself an adaptation action. Many MPAs are already undertaking actions as part of their normal act, normal management that do confer adaptation benefits for climate change. Doing things like protecting biodiversity, enhancing connectivity, uh, restoring areas, all of these things confer climate adaptation benefits. But we can greatly enhance that benefit by intentionally and explicitly considering climate change from the very beginning of the planning process. Doing so allows us to make decisions in a way that directly addresses climate change and oftentimes can change the types of decisions that we make, even if the ultimate action is the same that we would have done anyway under our traditional management practices, just by considering climate change early on, considering the need to be adaptive and resilient, some of our sub-actions, the way we undertake that action, such as restoration or selection of a site might be slightly different and can often go a very, very long way in allowing us to be adaptive and resilient and confer increased adaptation and resilience on the resources that we manage. Another critical step is monitoring. Monitoring environmental conditions is incredibly important. Understanding how things are changing in our area allows us to establish a baseline, as well as to get an understanding of the changes that we may need to make to our management in the future if we're going to be continue if we're going to continue to be adaptive. In fact, not only do we have to monitor environmental conditions, we also need to monitor our own adaptation actions. And this really gets at the heart of some of the things we're going to talk about today in our breakout groups. We need to understand whether or not the actions that we're taking are actually being successful, actually conferring the adaptation and resilience benefits that we hope they are. And if they're not, we need to change those actions. And that's just the adaptive management cycle. I'm not saying anything that you all probably haven't heard before. But how do we start doing these things? How do we actually incorporate adaptation and climate change considerations purposefully and intentionally into our planning processes from the very beginning? Well, one thing that we can do is try to understand the vulnerability of our resources. We do this through vulnerability assessments, and these vulnerability assessments allow us to understand which resources are vulnerable to climate change, particularly why they're vulnerable to climate change. But that's not really far enough to get us to our adaptation. We have to take that next step. We have to use the information from our vulnerability assessment to inform adaptation actions. And planning using strategies like scenario planning and foresighting can really allow us to take that information we get about vulnerability and apply it in a positive and meaningful way that allows for much more manageable and actionable management actions. Undertaking activities like scenario planning and foresighting, we can understand what possible futures may look like and identify actions that allow us to move forward towards the future conditions that we want, or at the very least, mitigate, mitigate undesirable conditions 
in futures that we don't necessarily want to see, but don't always have a choice when it comes to climate change. So this is up to this point, all kind of been planning this idea of incorporating resilience and adaptation and climate change into our planning from the beginning. What does that look like when we actually get on the ground and start doing these things? Well, a really good example is climate informed restoration. Restoration is inherently taking a degraded ecosystem and trying to make it look like it looked in the past, right? We are restoring to a past state. But we can restore with future states in mind. If we consider climate change and future conditions and adaptation from the very beginning of our restoration actions, we can take actions like thin sediment layer deposition, which you see happening on that salt marsh. We're restoring the salt marsh, but doing so with future sea level rise conditions in mind. Or growing corals that might be temperature or ocean acidification adapted to restore our coral reef so that it is more adaptive to future conditions. Now, unfortunately, we can't do everything. And sometimes they don't really have a choice. We can't save everything. It's an unfortunate realization that we have when we have climate change. Sometimes conservation in specific species or habitats may no longer be possible. It could be because that species or habitat, the conditions have changed enough where it's just not going to be able to be maintained in that area. Or it may be because, let's face it, we have limited resources. MPAs are large. We cannot do everything everywhere. So in such instances, we may need to shift our conservation idea from conserving specific species and habitats to conserving ecosystem function. And planning for this from the beginning, making sure that we are making this decision intentionally allows us to move into that adaptation action with intentionality, with clear eyes, and ensure that we are making best use of our resources and best use of our capacity in order to maximize the adaptation benefit that we can confer on the resources that we manage. What this often looks like in terms of considering ecosystem function is considering alternative states. So I mentioned scenario planning a minute, a couple of minutes ago. We also have frameworks such as the resist accept direct framework, which you may have, which you may have heard of uh, previously. I would recommend you take a look at this after. I'm not gonna go too deeply into it right now, but what both of these uh, frameworks allow us to do is consider alternative futures. Okay, consider what our resources might look like in the future under climate change and make informed decisions about the way we're going to, to manage those resources, even if that informed decision is to continue doing what we've been doing in the future, in the past. Intentionally moving forward with that action allows us to make better decisions when we do apply adaptation and resilience actions to our resources. Now, the last major piece I want to hit on is this right here. We as a conservation community, need to do a better job of incorporating people into our management and planning. If we are going to successfully address the impacts of climate change and enhance the adaptation of our resources, we need to move away from the historic Western idea of fortress conservation, where we draw a line around an area and let it be. We, people, must play an active role in conservation if we are going to help our resources adapt, because we're going to have to get in the water and take actions to help them adapt. We also must consider the role that humans play in the ecosystem. We are inextricably linked. And one of a good starting place for doing this is being more intentional about the incorporation of indigenous knowledge, management practice, and other ways of knowing. Indigenous peoples and indigenous Indigenous peoples and tribal communities have been practicing this way of management for time immemorial, and we are seeing and have seen and have seen for thousands of years the benefits of doing so for allowing our resources to adapt to change. I don't want to go too deeply into this, but one very good example is clan gardens, a traditional practice by First Nations and tribal peoples of the Pacific Northwest. This cultural practice is being reinvigorated in recent years. Clam gardens are created in order to provide an area 
America that provides subsistence for these peoples. But we, we are also seeing is that when these areas are restored, when they are managed actively for the human use as well as for the uh, as well as for the conservation of the organisms found in them they provide enhanced ecological diversity and food security they provide enhanced climate resilience both for the organisms in the clam garden and coastal protection so this incorporation of humans and human use into our management can provide increased benefits the last thing I want to say, because uh, we're taught we're NAMPAN, we're talking about a network, right? I didn't want to spend all my time talking about proximity because I've done that in the past. But incorporating these principles into network design increases and massively multiplies their impact. MPA networks allow greater consideration of connectivity, species and habitat movement, replication of habitats, incorporation of refugia, and more. So these benefits that we talk about of incorporating resilience from the beginning of planning into MPAs just multiply when we talk when we incorporate them into networks as well. So with that, I want to stop blabbering on and ensure that we have uh, that we have time to move on to our speakers. So I'm going to stop sharing. Apologies if I have oh, can I stop sharing? Okay, apologies, I believe I have stopped sharing. Someone correct me if I'm wrong. I would like to turn it over to our next two speakers who are going to each give a brief presentation on their work related to our deep dive topic of understanding adaptation actions. At the end of those converse, uh, presentations, we're going to have a short Q&A with all three of us being able to answer questions. Uh, so just hold your questions till then. I will say you can go ahead and drop them in the chat as we're going, if you would like, and we'll get to many as many of them as we possibly can. So now I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Andrea Brightham Buckles, a postdoctoral fellow at the Fisheries and Marine Institute at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Andrea, Andrea's current research focuses on evaluating how ecosystems protected by marine conservation areas in Newfoundland, in Newfoundland and Labrador will respond to climate change. Andrea's research interests lie in understanding potential future changes in marine ecosystems due to ongoing climate change and in assessing consequences as well as solutions for fisheries management and marine biodiversity conservation in a changing ocean. Andrea is the Science and Outreach Coordinator for the Fisheries and Marine Ecosystem Intercomparison Project, or FISHMIP, is interested in science communication, is a passionate writer, and an academic writing advisor. Andrea was a postdoctoral fellow and obtained a PhD in marine biology from Dalhousie University. Andrea will now present her presentation on marine conservation under climate change, Atlantic Canada. Andrea, I'd like to turn it over to you. All right, thank you, Zach. I think you set the stage really well. Okay, so I will give a brief overview of some recent work. Um, I think it was published last year and uh, something I'm involved in right now. And uh, I will specifically focus on, next slide please. On impact assessments and monitoring. So it really ties into what Zach just said. So we need to know what's going on to be able to adapt. And we can do that through impact assessments and also monitoring. And I'll start with impact assessments. This is just the next slide, please. It's a paper that um, I, where I presented an um, ensemble ecosystem model approach to show what, how marine protected areas are being affected by climate change. It's just for you, the, um, the citation there. Okay. Next slide. So we were interested in how climate change in the Northwest Atlantic impacts uh, marine protected areas, which are the pink ones and in blue the OECMs, because in Canada's marine protection protected areas, it's not really a network yet, but the number of them are increasing also in line with international agreements. And there is an increasing need to know what's going on and to to monitor and it's also been just published but we have also known that for a bit longer that there is a limited integration of climate change adaptation in the planning and management in canada and also globally next slide please so what i did i 
because I'm also part of Kishmet, we have an ensemble of global marine ecosystem models that project total consumer biomass or, or um, animal biomass, which is larger than zooplankton. And we have nine models and those were um, forced or projected by climate models or earth system models. But I also looked on other variables such as bottom and surface temperature, oxygen, pH, primary production, and phytoplankton and zooplankton biomass. And next slide. With this, uh, apologies for all the text. Um, I think I had animations. Never mind. I had an ensemble mean, so we put all the models together to get a mean change. Um, it's considered one of the more robust methods to look at climate change projections into the future. And I was interested in single factor climate hotspots in the future. So where do we see the highest and where do we see the lowest rates of decreases or increases in either animal biomass or all the different um, environmental variables? And then, because nothing happens in isolation, I was interested in cumulative climate impacts. And here I looked into where we can see the highest or lowest changes in at least three of the environmental drivers. And some of them are listed there. Next slide. I'm just going to go into a couple of uh, results because there were a lot. So this is, I think, quite striking to see the sea surface temperature here, where it's along the shelf, which makes sense where the water is a bit shallower. Um, you can see climate hot spots, so where the X's are, and it covers all the marine protected areas. It's a bit hard to see, but it covers all the, the pink shapes and many of the OECMs as well. And if we look at primary productivity, so that's phytoplankton productivity, so how much nutrients do we have in the ocean? Um, it's a bit different, um, but still in the, it does, it does uh, project an increase in production because it's getting warmer. So this needs to be a bit discussed in more nuance, but, but we can do that also in the breakout groups. And the final figure, next slide, for that paper, it's the cumulative um, impacts. And here um, we saw that 75 of the 75 percent of all MPAs in that region were within those cumulative hotspots. So within the areas with the X's and the squares around, um, at least uh, three or more than three or four drivers were changing rapidly which could have effects on the um, effectiveness or the objective of those very protected areas in the region. And overall, the conclusion was based on that analysis that no conservation area overlaps with those cumulative refugia. So all of them, so the, all of the areas that are slowly changing according to this data um, are not covered by any of protected measures yet, let's say so. Okay. Next slide, please. All right, moving on to the monitoring. So this is the most recent project I'm part of. I'm still in the middle of analysis. So this is more like an overview to show you what um, the Marine Institute has been doing in the last two years in the MCA project. That's what we call it. Next slide. And it's quite a it's, I think, so far quite a unique project, not in their objective, um, while we are combining research, training, and technological capacities so that we can get a strong scientific basis to evaluate the efficacy of um, MCAs or marine protected areas. Next slide. But the unique part is that it is from the beginning closely um, in close relationship and close collaboration with DFO or the uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada. So. DFO provides the funding, but MI organizes, designs, and carries out the surveys. Um, but it's in constant communication with DFO. And it fills this gap of like, um, I guess the science and the, the policy gap or the, the academic and the non-academic gap in a way, um, because it is, everything is targeted so, so that DFO can use what kind of data we, um, the Marine Institute is collecting. Next slide, please. So 
the goal is also to find a framework to have mostly non-invasive methods. And over the years, they have tried a lot of things and some of them have worked, some of them have not worked. So because in Canada, some of the, the, the marine protected areas of Newfoundland are really, really deep. So they realize okay, they can't um, map, map or survey all the areas. But in that list, you can see some of the, the methods. And so the data that been, is being collected is oceanographic from the CTD. We also have biodiversity indicators through the eDNA. So that's quite a new method uh, within Marine Institute. There are videos and also acoustic mappings for biomass and abundance estimates, and also mar marine mammals and bird observers. So it's it's trying to be very comprehensive to understand what's going on in all these marine, um, MCAs or marine protected areas. Next slide, please. So as I said, this program depends and is actually also uh, thriving because of those partnerships. It's really working well. Um, there's a lot of training um, for students, but also um, other scientists, and it's, it uses a new combination and contributes novel data to guide those assessments throughout, so also in the future. And it is adaptive monitoring because they have a lot of challenges. And now we're thinking, okay, how can we triage which MPAs or MCAs we should monitor because we can't monitor everything. As Zach also said, there is limited resources. so. This is where I think impact assessments can point towards where we need to monitor, where we need to put our efforts to really have an effective monitoring design and an effective adaptive management um, for those areas. And um, yeah, this will continue for hopefully many more years. And um, if you want to know more just about me, there's all my contact details. And if you want to know more about FishMip, you can email me or go to the website all the data we're using in FishMap is publicly available as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Now, I would like to introduce our second speaker, Dr. Andy Bruckner, the research coordinator for Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary in Florida, the United States. Andy has conducted research, monitoring, restoration, and conservation projects on coral reefs worldwide since 1979 with a focus on understanding and addressing large-scale changes to coral reefs. He joined NOAA in 1998 and over the next 10 years worked closely with NOAA's Coral Reef Conservation Program. Beginning in 2010, he served as lead scientist for the Living Oceans Foundation, where he developed and led a six-year global reef expedition. In 2016, he established Coral Reef CPR, a small nonprofit charity that is working to restore reefs in the Indian Ocean through research, education, and low-tech coral gardening and restoration programs. Andy joined the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary in 2018, where he has been focusing his efforts on the response to stony coral tissue loss disease, or SCT, mission iconic reefs, and the restoration movement. Dr. Bruckner holds degrees in biology and marine biology from the University of Oregon, Northeastern University, and the University of Puerto Rico. He has received the Presidential Early Career Award, Administrator's Award, and five bronze medals from NOAA for his work on coral reefs. Andy will now present on his presentation on Mission Iconic Reefs, Rethinking Outplanting in Response to Climate Stresses. Andy? Thank you, Zach. Um, hopefully this is going to work because I'm actually not in Florida right now and we're having a snowstorm. <laughs> I'm on Cape Cod and there's like 60 mile an hour winds right now. So hopefully this will all work. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to just introduce Mission Iconic Reefs. I want to provide a really brief overview. I don't want to explain the overarching details of our restoration strategy, the other complementary conservation actions we have, but I really want to just focus on coral. And I want to talk a little bit about what our coral targets are, how we propose to track and monitor the progress of the outplanting, and then move into a little bit about some of the challenges we're facing, as well as the sort of big picture considerations in light of the setbacks that we experienced during this 2023 marine heat wave. And so for introductory purposes, this, um, this first slide, it shows the seven reef systems that are a part of Mission Iconic Reefs. They extend from the Upper Keys, just south of the Biscayne National Park, to um, Eastern Dry Rocks, which is located off of Key West in the Lower Keys. 
um, along the reef track, which is about 180 miles long or 290 kilometers. Um, and all of these sites are located, ex except for one, are located within what we call sanctuary preservation areas. So the larger sanctuary is zoned for multiple uses. And we have um, some of our reefs that we've established as sanctuary preservation areas are basically small, no-take MPAs located within this larger sanctuary. So if you go to the next slide, please. So Mission Iconic Reefs um, was intended when we first impl started implementing this to be a two-phase project starting in December of 2019 and running to about 2035. And what our goal was, was to reverse the tra downward trajectory of um, living coral. We basically had about 2% living coral cover left within these seven Mission Iconic Reef sites when we first started. And we wanted to increase that cover to about 25%. And the reason for that is, is basically there's some literature from a while back that is if you can return these reefs to about 25% cover, the idea is that they would be self-sustaining and you don't need to keep putting corals back out onto those reefs. Next slide, please. So in order to um, determine how many corals we need and to track progress, what we did is we divided each reef system into the different habitat types. Um, th there's between five to eight habitat types, depending on where these are located along the shelf. Um, and then we may map the spatial extent of all these habitat types. We determined how much of that overall area was actually reef habitat or hard bottom. And then we estimated of that hard bottom habitat, how much of it could we possibly restore? Um, so the next um, slide, what I'm showing as an example here is one of the reefs, Eastern Dry Rocks. We then looked at a combination of historic literature, what we've seen over, over several years within the Florida Keys in terms of some of the monitoring data and what we really hope to try to achieve to determine what corals we wanted to put in different habitat types and how much. And so basically we looked at historical information to, to determine the, the coverage of these major species groups um, within each one of these um, habitat types. Um, next slide. So we then um, used the combination, as I said, of the coral literature. We looked at what the typical growth rates of these corals. We looked at how large the different outplants are that the restoration practitioners are putting on these reefs and how they orient those outplants. Do they plant in clusters, individual corals, so on and so forth? And then what is their typical survival? Using all those metrics, we came up with calculations of the total number of mature colonies that we wanted on each reef system by major taxa um, to achieve those particular um, um, target levels. And again, the numbers of what we needed to outplant are much, much higher than what the targets of what we want to achieve because we were estimating for purposes of simplicity and because we wanted to ultimately achieve mature, reproductively mature corals, we were estimating what it would take to achieve colonies that are about one meter squared in diameter. Um, next slide, please. We then divided these reef systems into a series of segments. This is largely to assist in tracking um, because we have several different practitioners that are working in each of these reef systems. And so there's three main practitioners and we basically gave them different segments to do their outplanting. And then within those segments, we established restoration monitoring strips and control strips. This is how we are tracking both outplanting progress um, and looking at a lot of the other fates. What our monitoring approach is, in addition to those strips, we have these permanent 10 by 10 meter permanent stations located in each of the habitat types throughout all of the reef systems. Um, and what we're looking at is we're trying to understand how both structural complexity and ecosystem function on these reefs changes over time. And so our basic monitoring approach includes fish assessments, it includes benthic monitoring. We are assessing motile invertebrates. We're doing coral surveys. And then we have a whole series of in-water sensors that we're placing at these sites. 
and we also do photogrammetry work. So next slide, please. Um, so when we started Mission Iconic Reefs, we knew that this really was not going to be an easy task. Um, we know that our reefs didn't die overnight, and the many of the stressors that are affecting corals have only worsened. Next slide, please. When you look at our reefs today, most of these reef systems are now carpeted in what I call nuisance species. These are species that are preventing natural settlement and recruitment of corals. They limit our ability to put corals back onto these reefs. And they are some of the main factors that cause mortality to the corals after we outplant. Um, next slide. And then getting at this year, um, Florida and Florida Keys in particular experienced the worst marine heat wave on record. Temperatures on our reefs exceeded 33 degrees Celsius early on in like mid-June into July. And overall, we had reefs that had more than 20 degree heating weeks over this period. Um, next slide, please. So while we never had expected such extremes, we have been taking climate change in, into account in our restoration approach. And I'm not going to go into the details here, but we have a whole series of strategies for more of a holistic effort to restore these reefs um, that includes everything from restoring herbivores to site prep and site maintenance. What I want to just talk about just briefly to end my talk is a little bit about what I'm calling coral enhancements. Um, so if you go to um, the next slide, one of our initial goals within the Florida Keys has been to preserve as much genetic stock as possible. This really started um, about eight years ago when we had this devastating outbreak of something called stony coral tissue loss disease that moved through the reefs. And then in response to bleaching events, we've been rescuing corals from these reefs and putting them into land-based systems. And we've also gone through the, the reef systems and we've mapped all of the remaining wild founder genets for some of the really important ESA listed corals like elkhorn coral and staghorn coral. We have monitoring programs in place to track these wild colonies. And we've moved fragments of every known genotype of um, a founder genet into gene banks, both on land, and we've duplicated this in our in-water nurseries. Now, the other thing is when we first started this, we have really emphasized the need to ensure when, when you outplant to maximize genotypic diversity, ultimately with the goal of not only having a high number of genets of each, each um, taxa that we're outplanting, but also genets that are more resistant to some of these stressors. And I just threw this in to show you to date how many different genets have been put out onto these reefs. So it's really pretty high. We have you know anywhere from up to about 130 um, different unique genetic strains of stag coral that have been put onto our Mission Iconic Reef sites. Next slide, please. As well as um, about 160 genotypes of elkhorn coral. Next slide, please. Nevertheless, even though we had so many different genotypes during this year's event, we lost over 90% of all the outplants that we put onto these reefs. And we've now started taking a much closer look at a lot of the decisions that we made in our strategies and looking at what we really need to do to try to modify these based on some of the lessons that we learned over the first year. Um, and so I want to just end the last slide. I don't want to go into a lot of details here because I figured some of this would come up in the discussions down the road. But um, the last slide, if you go to the last slide. Um, so the big thing is, is we held our first workshop to really look at what was the outcomes of this event and where are we going in the future. And so we are now really starting back over rethinking what we're doing. We're looking at broader species. We're looking at different ways to outplant. We're a, it, we're continuing to search for new of these genotypes that weren't in our collections, things that survived the ble bleaching event, and doing a lot more work looking at ways to both identify which genotypes perform the best under different conditions, which ones um, have symbionts that may allow them to survive heat stress and other corals, and what we can do to actually, what I call stress hardening, what we can do to these corals to acclimate them to certain conditions so that they are more likely to survive on the reef. And I'll stop there. Thank you, Andy. And I would actually like to thank both of our speakers. And at this point, we're going to begin the question and answer session with our speakers, Andrea and Andy, myself as well, if you happen to have questions for me. So please put any questions that you have in the chat 
and we will do the best we can to get as many to get to as many of the questions as we possibly can. But I'd like to open it up with a question for Andrea. Considering that 75% of MPAs and 39% of OECMs in your study area are located within climate hotspots, what are the next steps for MPA planning and design to ensure that more conservation areas are located within climate refugia? That's a very good question. Um, first of all, I think... Um, so this data is it's based on global marine ecosystem models. So it needs to, it's very coarse. So I think we need to have a bit more site specific um, analysis done for those that are in the hotspots. Maybe, I mean, there are many of them, but uh, maybe those that are most important for certain species or biodiversity. Um, I think though for, for management, like planning, uh, I think it's important to, based on this data, to see where new areas should be placed. And I think some of it is already um, being talked about and they're trying to, to use this data to overlay it with like future um, network planning um, to add more either OECMs or MPAs that actually hopefully might be in a refuge yeah. That's so far what I know. <laughs> it's a long process. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely a long and complicated process. Yeah, yeah. So thank you for that answer. Um, so the next question is for Andy. Andy, wondering how does Mission Iconic Reefs measure the progress and effectiveness of coral restoration within the Keys, particularly of some of those genets that we think might be a bit more temperature or uh, <laughs> disease resistant. So through our, so there's several different types of monitoring. There's monitoring that each of the practitioners are required to do as part of their permit requirements. And so they're basically going into each one of their outplant plots and they have to look at survival and identify you know stressors partial mortality total colony mortality disease so on and so forth for um those corals at a 30-day period right now in a one-year period we're looking much closer at that to see how we want to modify that but that actually gives us information on um the different genotypes because they record all this and there's tags on the bottom of every single genotype that's out there so that's the first thing that we're diving into a little deeper um, the second piece is we are now actually doing a whole reassessment of the outcomes of bleaching because the one thing that we didn't do is the practitioners have basically tried to do management scale outplanting. They did many fewer sort of experiments looking at performance in the field. We did certain aquaria experiments. We started to do some experiments in nurseries to see how different genets performed um, under different um, temperature loads. But what we were really trying to do was just to maximize what we were putting out on the reef initially with the goal of, of increasing cover as fast as possible so we provide more structure for other species. And the intent was then over time to look more closely at what did survive and start focusing more on those genets as well as other ways to plant, um, looking at, you know, different, different, um, whether we use structures, whether we do more mixed out planning sort of efforts. And so we're now rethinking the monitoring that we're doing. So, so currently all the monitoring has been of the corals is largely either going in the water, doing belt transects through those plots or doing photo mosaics and going back and trying to rectify based on the tag numbers, what the survival is of different genets. Thank you. Uh, so the next question we have, I believe, is directed at me, but I actually want to open it up to, to all the speakers. So I guess I'll answer first, then ask the opinion of Andy and Andrea. So how can MPA managers strike a balance between conservation objectives, such as the preservation of specific habitats or species, and climate adaptation goals? And I guess my answer would be, kind of what I presented on. We need to think about these things from the very beginning. We can try and incorporate decision processes like the Resist Accept Direct framework, scenario planning, 
and actually intentionally sit down, discuss where we might need to change our management priorities, where we might not be able to continue to maintain a particular species or habitat in a particular area, or where we might shift resources to ensure that we do, frankly, at the expense of other resources in our area, because we can't do it all. And I think critically, we need to share those experiences. We need to test and record whether or not what we're doing is working. And we need to be honest and upfront with our stakeholders and our communities as to what we're doing and why we are doing it from the very beginning. Because as climate change continues to change the environment and change the pressures on our resources, our management's going to have to change in order to allow those resources to continue to adapt. We have to adapt as well. And we need to ensure the public, our communities and our stakeholders are aware of that from the beginning in order to continue to garner support and not make it seem like we're going off and doing something sneaky and they don't they don't know about it until the end. So we are running low on time. So I think maybe if we can get an answer from Andrea and Andy on that question as well, thoughts from Andrea and Andy on that question as well, that would be great. So I guess the speaker order, I'll hand it over to Andrea first. I think your answer was very comprehensive and um touch upon most of the things I thought about. Um, I can only speak for Canada. I know the whole process is very slow and it's quite um, siloed among uh, across like DFO departments or provinces. So, and just or cross national institutions. So I think it's what I would add on is we need to streamline uh, first of all, outcomes or learning, like what we've learned through the adaptation process or monitoring, whatever what we're learning in this process, it needs to be communicated across um, institutions. Um, we can't continue just to, to do our little things in each of our institution. And that's just already just within Canada. And I think this is actually what we're doing right now, which is great. So it's a good start. Um, and I need to go. I have a meeting in one minute, another one, unfortunately. Um, I will try to answer some questions online in the Google Docs, if possible, a bit later today. Well, thank you, Andrea. And I will okay. turn it over to Andy. All right. Well, thank you. Um, so for the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, I'd say the one number one thing that's the most important thing to any of our conservation measures is partnerships. Everything we do in the sanctuary is based on partnerships. We have a sanctuary advisory council, which includes representatives of every single user group, community groups, the state and federal government agencies that all are there. We, and we all try to work together on a lot of these issues. We don't necessarily always agree, but we try to come up with a balance. The second thing I'd say is we have these things called blue star operators. These are both trained um, fishing operators, as well as dive operators that basically are taking out a lot of the tourists out on you know recreational opportunities where they provide more education and explain a number of the challenges we face and try to get them engaged. We also have huge stewardship programs within the Keys where we're actually engaging people to help us with the monitoring, help with some of the restoration work because we know this is a huge task and we can't do this. And by doing those things, it's one way that we're able to get more support for some of our measures. And then the last piece that I'd just have to say is as we're moving forward, we're not doing restoration in a vacuum. We have, we're in the process of getting ready to release something called a restoration blueprint, which is the first new management plan for the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary since 2000. It includes um, non-regulatory management measures as well as new zoning and other sorts of things that are designed to try to minimize some of the human impacts that are affecting these things. Like, so for instance, where we're doing a lot of the Elkhorn and Staghorn coral rest restoration, theoretically you can anchor. And that's been one of the biggest impacts to those corals. We outplant them and then someone anchors and they get ripped up. And so we're trying to do measures that are complementary at the same time and educate um, the community groups so that they buy into this because the whole intent of a sanctuary is to, to promote both conservation and sustainable use. And I'll just leave it at that. 
Thanks, Andy. And I want to thank both of our speakers, Andrea and Andy, for the really interesting and engaging conversation. And to all of you, our participants, for some of the questions and for your attention. Now is when we're really going to turn to you, our participants. So I'm going to pass it over to Catherine, who will introduce us to our breakout groups. Welcome back, everybody. I hope we had some great discussion. I know we did in the group that I was a part of. So now we want to take some time to hear some main takeaways for each of the groups from their discussion before we move into a more open panel, a more open plenary discussion. So if group one, which is uh, Eric's group, would mind kicking us off, that'd be fantastic. I don't know who your designated presenter is, but yeah. I'll turn it over to them. I will. Yeah, thank you all in group one for the great conversation. And Sarah Hutto, I'm going to let you uh, give us a quick recap. Thank you. All right, sure. Um, like just a couple minutes, Zach. Like, okay, I'm not gonna, I won't talk forever. Um, the first thing I'll mention is we kind of, there are a couple of us that are focusing currently on, on whales and considering they're highly migratory. And so there's need for a lot of international collaboration. Whales tended to be the framing for a little bit of what we were talking about. So not only that they're, you know, they range widely across international boundaries, but we're also seeing climate impacts on where they spend their time and also climate change is kind of changing how whales and people are interacting. So kind of exacerbating some of those non-climate stressors. And kind of on that same note, for a lot of marine protected areas, our, you know, climate adaptation response is still kind of traditional conservation in a sense, and it's trying to reduce non-climate stressors. So sticking with the whale example, that's, you know, trying to reduce ship strikes on whales because that's a leading cause of mortality because we can't do anything about um, some of those big climate impacts, you know, ocean warming, which is limiting where their, where their prey is and where they can feed. So I think, you know, that we're still a little bit not stuck, but we're, we're still kind of focusing on those non-climate stressors because um, climate stressors are harder for us to manage. Um, we also talked about the need to share and communicate across boundaries to inform national and international policy. Um, one great point that Lisa with uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada brought up is another great kind of adaptation response is the use of networks of, of protected areas. So identifying areas that are projected to experience a whole lot of change and ensuring that those areas are reflected representatively in the network, but also protecting areas that are projected to not change and they could kind of be climate refugia. Um, so the use of networks of protection kind of across the spectrum of what we're expecting to see is another great adaptation approach that I think MPAs are starting to use more. Um, let's see. And anyone in my group can step in. We talked a little bit about monitoring and kind of the need to institutionalize or formalize monitoring because long-term data sets are really critically important and there's not usually a lot of great funding for supporting continued monitoring. Um, so that should kind of be incorporated into any sort of international level collaborations or treaties or frameworks that are developed. Um, and then I think the last thing I'll share, and then other folks can jump in, is how do we define success when we're monitoring for the impact of any sort of management strategies that we're implementing? And is that maintaining certain species or is it maintaining ecosystem function and how do we kind of redefine what success looks like for climate adaptation? So that's it from me. Does anybody else from my group want to add anything? Okay. Thank you, Sarah. Well, thanks, Sarah. So yeah, let's go ahead and move on to group two. And I, that was my group. I believe Deb, you're going to be representing us. I am, yes, but please folks, um, if I am missing any of your favorite points or misstepping, uh, jump on in. Um, so some of the big takeaways from our group were discussions around how important it is to share failures um, and learn from failures and how that is not, it, how that can be politically difficult and um, 
needing the right frameworks in which to share that information so that we can learn from each other. Um, we also talked about monitoring, and I think group one brought this up as well, the elephant in the room, as our, I believe Zach called it, the um, lack of funding um, and the need for more funding to properly implement uh, monitoring programs, but also understanding which, when, and how to choose the appropriate actions, knowing that we cannot fund them all. Um, and then there was also quite a bit of conversation around collaborating with other conservation organiz organizations and scales of organizations um, in order to form successful partnerships um, and facilitate new the implementation of new ideas. Um, anything else my group wants to add to that? That's it. All right, thanks, Deb. So last but not least, we have group three. So Laura, who from your group will be presenting? Oh, that will be me. Um, yeah, so folks again can jump in, but some of the things that really stood out to us, either that seemed like really important points to bring back to everyone or that came up multiple times from different folks um, was the importance first to develop indicators and thresholds with local communities, um, particularly folks who might be living in the reserve. Um, Anna gave a great example of in their um, preserve, they went to local communities and had them co-develop what the indicators were, the different determinants of well-being. So some of those food, health, education, um, climate change impacts, and then what the thresholds were um, for change and what, what at at levels that were actually meaningful to the community. Um, and so that came up. Um, another point is that came up from a couple of different people was that they're seeing that often there's a mismatch between the indicators, particularly indicators at a sanctuary wide scale, and then the scale necessary for actually making decisions. Um, I think Andy gave an example of in Florida, you know, they have to have one number for desired coral cover, which just doesn't describe the different locations when you have a really large preserve. Um, and so it just prevents them from making effective management decisions. So matching indicators to the scale at which you need to make effective decisions. Um, and then the final thing that we wanted to mention was, came up a few times um, that it's important to include indicators for looking at the presence of new species moving into an area rather than just what's already there. Um, and then also, I think group one mentioned this, but the need to shift from looking at indicators that just um, are tracking the current ecosystem, but instead to look at the services that that ecosystem provides, because as the, the composition or the type of ecosystem changes, if you're what you're wanting to do is continue um, maintaining the services rather than the ecosystem in its current or historical state. Any additions or clarifications from my group? Did I miss anything? Okay, great. Thank you. That was a great, great discussion. All right, thanks everybody. Yeah, it sounds like there was a lot of great discussions in the groups. It sounds like there was a lot of similarities as well in a lot of the things that were discussed, which is fantastic. So now we have about 20, 25 minutes to open it up to a larger plenary discussion. What we're going to do is we're going to target some of the questions that we actually covered during the breakout group and we're going to try and have a, a larger plenary discussion around these. So I would encourage you to just use your raise hand function if you want to speak. We just have quite a few people on the call. And um, frankly, because I can't see everyone on the tile all at the same time, the raise hand function will pop you right up to the top and I can make sure to call on you. But we want to dive into some of these questions that are a little bit more targeted to the larger group and, you know, bounce ideas off of each other, things like that. So I think the first one that we might want to dive into is that first overarching question. What, how do we define success? And I think that really comes down to a lot of, a lot of what can drive what we do. How do you define success when evaluating performance and effectiveness of climate change strategies within MPAs? And how do you determine what indicators or metrics should be considered? We'd love to hear some examples and some thoughts from people.
and Zach, is that question? Hi, this is Eric. Um, about oh, sorry, the hands up, a hand up. I don't mean to talk over someone. No problem. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, well, I don't know if I'm actually going to answer Zach's question so much as get excited about kind of group what Group Three had talked about in terms of like sometimes you might have to shift. What th like th rethink about what you're monitoring. Are you monitoring for the ecosystem service? And one of the things I struggle with in monitoring, maybe this goes back to your question about goals, Zach, is that often our our kind of condition monitoring proto systems and protocols are really set up to monitor change. And climate change means that most things are changing. And so it's actually getting at like, what is it that we care about this feature or factor or species or element? Um, that means that the, tells us whether that change is good or bad or neutral, right? Like, and I think that really comes down to that threshold or trigger identification. And so monitoring is, I think you need those, almost all three of those things. You need to know why you're monitoring and you need to know kind of what your thresholds might be, even if it's kind of just thinking it through and i think when you reach those thresholds you almost have to reopen the conversation again be like is are we monitoring the thing that we set we care about are we because i think we're always we do need that adjustment component anyway that's i love that uh, that point from group three so thanks for that yeah thank you and i think i'm gonna credit you for something that you had said at some point which is we often don't know what our conservation goals are we think we do and then if you force managers to sit down and actually define them, a lot of times we don't really have them down at the level that we would need to target these kind of monitoring goals, right? So I think it does. I think what you're saying also gets back to this idea of defining our goals and our objectives from the beginning and doing it in as thorough and specific a way as we can to ensure that we are effectively allocating our resources, our time, and our effort. Um, Andy, I see you have your hand raised. Yeah, just for, from the restoration perspective within the sanctuary, when we first started doing restoration, it was not in light of climate change. And it was, and, and a lot of it in the beginning, people were just learning how to propagate corals, put them out on the reef. And all the monitoring that was done and the indication of success was looking on a colony by colony. Well, it started out as a fragment basis. And it was basically, you had to measure certain metrics, like whether that coral cemented to the bottom, how big it was, how many times it branched, so on and so forth. And it was looking at coral survival. We have those metrics that the practitioners have provided to us of what they thought their survival was, but we know that doesn't necessarily work um, just because there's so many new threats, threats that are um, you know synergistically impacting these corals, so on and so forth. But what we want to go away from that because we're actually, the corals, are, you know, in effect, the, the trees of our forest that we're trying to create. We're trying to create habitat. That's what the corals are, is the habitat, if you will. And so what we want, our measure of success, we are using cover as a measure because we don't want to look at individuals. We want to look at how that reef system has changed. And because of the new tools that are out there using photogrammetry, you can easily get three-dimensional rugosity with some of the models that are out there. So you can basically convert these corals into both how much of the bottom they've covered and how far up they've grown into the water column. And so theoretically how much habitat they've produced. So that's sort of our whole metric of success now is how much of the bottom. And it also goes from the fact that because these corals grow and they, some of them can grow indeterminately, theoretically, um, you, you're going to put out a lot more corals knowing that a bunch of those are going to die, but the, as the other ones grow, they're going to fill in the, fill in the spaces sort of, if you will. So it's a different thing than looking at, at colony survival, but it's looking at change in the structure and functioning of that system really is that we would consider a metric of success in response to restoration in response to um, addressing climate stressors. Andy, what about like species composition? Are you concerned about the diversity of corals or just that they provide yeah. structure? Yeah, and that's a, it's a little nuance where we, the reason why when we first started Mission Iconic Reefs, we wanted to do a big bump up in structural complexity right away. And we picked Elkhorn and Staghorn Coral because those are the fastest growing corals we have. They're the ones that the practitioners have been working with for decades. 
Um, boulder corals take a lot longer. They're harder. There's a number of other challenges. And at the time when we started this, we had this disease that was ravaging our boulder coral. Stony coral tissue loss disease does not affect elkhorn and staghorn coral. So we thought, okay, let's just kick this off with those corals, giving everyone time for the research and development needed to move into these other species. Now we realize, you know, one of the errors of that is that because we had so much coral out there and then the climate stressors hit and we didn't have as diverse a community as we wanted to, that's why we're going back and rethinking this. And we're actually looking at multi-species assemblages now and doing what we're calling backfilling, if you will. So you, because you can't get like a, an operator will only plant one coral at a time just because of logistics. But in two days, they, they could do staghorn coral one day, boulder corals another day. And so the approach that we want is we want to do multiple species and multiple genotypes within a plot to have more of a natural reef system of, you know, what we think the reefs can support. You know, and the other approach, and I'll, sorry, I don't mean to take so much time. I'll be really quick with this. But the other approach with staghorn and elkhorn corals, historically, throughout the Caribbean, they formed what we call thickets, monospecific assemblages of these corals in certain habitat types. We don't think that, that Florida can support that anymore. It's not the way they're going to live because what happens is you're actually exacerbating impacts from climate stressors when you have one monospecific assemblage. And so what we want to do is we want to now go away from thickets and go to like little bushes, isolated things with all these corals spread in between it. And we think that that's going to be a much more successful strategy in this day and age with all the stressors that we're facing. Thank you, Andy. It's also really interesting to hear how the metrics changed over time, the reevaluation of the metrics, reevaluation of the strategy. And I think it's a really good example of this adaptive management strategy that we monitor, we see what works, we see what didn't work, and we change what we did. And I think that also ties into this idea of reporting our failures, reporting when we're wrong. We're going out there and doing what we're doing with the best available knowledge at the time. But if we just stick to it when it's not working, we're never going to make successful change. So thank you for sharing that. I think it's really helpful to hear that story and hear that experience from a place like Florida Keys that's been doing this kind of work for as long as you all have been doing it. Um, we have about 10 minutes left. So I do want to move on to another question. And this is targeted kind of as to how we can better work together as a network. Because ultimately, that's what this is. That's what NAMPAN is. We're a network of uh, practitioners that allows us to share these ideas and share our experiences. So one of the questions we really wanted to dive in on was how can knowledge exchange capacity building be improved to enhance evidence gathering for climate change, adaptation, and MPAs? And how can NAMPAN in particular play a part, at it, part in it? So how can we leverage these opportunities? How can we develop new opportunities? What is the role of NAMPAN and what is the role of knowledge exchange and capacity building more broadly to ensure that we are doing everything we can to move monitoring and uh, data gathering for climate change adaptation forward? I'll, I'll just say the way that we're trying to do it at, on our end, at least our these regional data portals, um, I'm, I'm involved with a few different groups that are kind of doing these joint needs assessment and trying to fund and, and logistically assemble these data portals. And so I know it's not a new concept, um, but it's kind of the way that that we've been achieving it recently. With a, you know, because we have all these groups doing these independent monitoring programs, some of them fairly long term. And it, it shocks me every time I go to like a meeting, a, a regional meeting, talk about what I do. And somebody says, I had no idea that that was even occurring. Can I please have your data? And luckily, everything that we do is open source. So the answer is always yes. So I know it's not reinventing, reinventing the wheel at all, um, but it's, you know, 
that they almost you need to reinvigorate that that concept every five to ten years just to kind of do an assessment of what we got and what do we need. Thanks, Greg. And I guess I, I'll a follow up question for you on that, because I do think that data question and that data portal question is important. Have you all explored ways to make that data make that those data portals more well known and more accessible? I know we have, you know, limitations being government associated a lot of times as to where links to these can be posted. But are there avenues where we can try and spread the word about these? The, the short answer is, and admitting it's a little bit of an echo chamber, but the more groups that participate in the data portal, the more groups publicize it in order to get their data out there. But, you know, everybody else gets drafted along with them. Um, you know, Noah has been doing a great job with their, say, their, you know, their social media end of things. Um, I discover new sources of data and new interfaces, you know, every day over my morning coffee. So, um you know, I'm not saying social media is the be all end all solution to the problem, but I'm just tipping my hat to Noah for doing a great job of of doing, you know, getting a diversity of topics and the diversity of uh, data sources out there into the public. Awesome. Andy, I see you have your hand up. So am I unmuted? Yeah, this is this is more of a question and I'm not because I'm not really that familiar with any of these organizations, but I've worked a little bit with MPA Connect. When when stony coral tissue loss disease first emerged in Florida, um, before, I guess, it, Mexico was the first place it hit, but MPA Connect really got us together to work with the, initially it was the Caribbean community and then Agra got involved, but really to have an exchange. And it was a learning exchange and it was actually exchange of people in some senses getting down to some of these MPA areas where, the disease first emerged and to try to, you know, assist some of those resource managers in interventions, whatever, you know, whatever different activities we did. And so I don't know if there's an op opportunity for something like this to do the same thing in terms of, of climate change, you know, addressing climate change stressors. Because the other piece that I think Noah has been really successful at in terms of us moving the stony coral tissue loss disease envelope forward is we also then had the Admiral several years ago had instigated, you know, first we developed that NOAA wide strategy uh, implementation plan and then a strategy. And so there still is a huge network working to understand this disease, to address it, to make sure it doesn't get to the Pacific. Um, and so I don't know if there's a possibility to, to, you know, look at that effort and see how you can do some, some similar things. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I do wonder if that's a role that NAMPAN might be able to play so that we're not just having these conversations at a national level, but a tri-national level. I think that we, I know I've seen even from the conversation today that learning from what uh, practitioners in different countries are doing helps to get different viewpoints and helps to uh, expand beyond kind of our silos and our ways of thinking that we have just because of the, the organizations that we work in. So absolutely love that idea. Was there anyone else? I could have sworn I saw another hand up there for a minute. Yeah, I was just gonna say so much of what we do um, is not published in peer reviewed literature. It's not easy for people to find. So how can we more effectively share the work while it's happening. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, that is a great point. And I don't know how to address it. But yeah, sharing the work that we're doing, because there does seem to be, it can be problematic, both if you only cite in scientific literature, and if you don't write in scientific literature at all because different people have access to each of those. Eric? Um, yeah, thank you. I just wanted to kind of echo and, and, and share what came up in group one's conversation. Um, I believe David had brought up some examples that exist right now that 
our um, international treaties around fisheries, fisheries management and open waters. Um, I think there was one uh, in the open waters Atlantic that came together in the last couple of years. But in addition to the species management is a whole suite of monitoring requirements um, that are quite broad um, that are built into that and countries are involved in maintaining those monitoring activities. So if there's a way, and, and, and I think his point was, and our group brought up, is if there's a political will behind things and an economic driver to some degree, then there can be quite a good organization level of organization and cooperation and commitment over the long term, and commitment being funding to do this monitoring and maintain these data sets. So there are some examples out there if it's brought to that kind of international treaty level of negotiation and uh, implementation. Um, and from that, good data can emerge. Thanks, Eric. Some great points. Uh, David, I see your hand up. Yeah, just to add to that, you know, I, I mentioned the Central Arctic Ocean High Seas Fisheries Agreement adopted a few years back. But again, it sets up a whole science monitoring program, uh, you know, for probably the next 60 years or so. So again, it's a high level treaty, political commitment, involves Canada, U.S. and uh, eight other parties. So it's, you know, again, they're trying to get ahead of the game of climate change and learn more about the ecosystem before we ever give out any licensing for fisheries. That's what, what, what they're trying to do, preventing commercial fisheries until we know more. Uh, and then I just want to mention also the uh, Canmung Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework. We have 23 targets. And one of those targets is a 30% MPAs by 3030. I mean, what a great opportunity for NAMPAN to be able to maybe bring together sharing of experiences, how the different countries are moving forward to meeting the targets. You know, what's working, what's not working, what are the challenges? Uh, are there enough political commitments? Uh, those are interesting questions as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Some great things to hit on for, to, to highlight these international agreements and the ability to move forward. So we're run, starting to run a little bit long time, but we do have a couple minutes left before we wrap up. So I do want to ask if anyone has anything else that they want to make sure that we bring to this whole group, uh, anything that came up in our breakout groups, anything that has occurred to you. We want to make sure that we get this information out. This is our chance to have this cross uh, cross-system, cross-country exchange, and also to influence EcoAdapts, uh, not, sorry, not EcoAdapts, NAMPAN's work in the future, maybe EcoAdapts as well. No additional thoughts and insights from anybody? Eric? Well, I wanted to kind of follow on the, the maybe inadvertent cue to EcoAdapt, but um, if something that I know EcoAdapt and our scientists are curious and learning, trying to learn more about, and also were uh, a, a, a driver for us to be interested to run this deep dive is to learn more about adaptation strategies that are being implemented on the ground how they're being monitored and if they're working or not. Um, we all know there's a short amount of time for us to begin to build resilience in our protected areas and these populations and ecosystem functionality. Um, and so we all need to learn and amplify what's working and learn from what's not working, obviously, quickly, so we can shift away from investing in some of those strategies. Um, I know from a coral reef perspective, it's an area that over the decades, there have been a lot of actions that are are being implemented to reduce their vulnerability. And we talked a lot about and heard a lot about um, restoration work and how it's trying to learn, iterate, improve over the work that's been done. Um, but those are the kind of things that I know EcoDAP would like to put together and share as broadly as possible. So we'll certainly try to play a catalyst in that, in that world. But the other side of that is we need to learn about how monitoring is being done on the ground uh, for those implemented activities. And so this has been a great conversation, but that's a conversation we would like to continue with all of you. Um, going forward as we've been to gather information and hopefully amplify these ideas and also share them and amplify them through networks like NAMPAN, et cetera, to those audiences. So thank you very much. Thanks, Eric. And Elizabeth, final word. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I don't know if this will be powerful enough for a final word, but I did like the slip of the tongue with the EcoAdapt and NAMPAM. And I will say, Fred, the, there's a 
conference coming up, the North American Congress of Conservation Biology in Vancouver, which will have a marine component. And, but I think at this at this workshop, I'm hoping to where there's a group of us are trying to have a conversation about rad and managing ecological transformation that will involve this idea of like matchmaking people who are who have problem who are like that not tools new tools so with people who want to try them matchmaking people have knowledge gaps with people who want to explore them and i do think nampan and eco adapt have big roles to play like you guys are more connected to cake or these platforms that allow us to do that matchmaking and sometimes i think and this maybe speaks to some of the the things that have come up here is this like earlier order matchmaking right like we have you don't put something on cake until it's kind of done but this idea that we're thinking about this idea this adaptation action who is uh, who is doing it like or who's just a few steps ahead of us and that matchmaking role i think would be really powerful both across organizations small big and across kind of landscapes anyway just throwing that out there Absolutely, some fantastic points. Uh, so we're almost out of time. So I would like to hand a uh, thank you all for sticking with me. And I'd like to hand it over to Catherine to close us out. Thank you, Zach. And thanks everyone for all of your contributions and everything you shared. I think we had a wonderful discussion and I hope you enjoyed your breakouts as well. Um, and I'd also like to give a special thank you to all of our speakers and our interpreters and everyone here who's from the NAMPAN Steering Committee. It was great to see you here today. Um, I wanted to let you know before we leave that we will be putting together a summary report about the event today. We'll include major themes and our key takeaways into a synthesis document. We'll also be sharing any resources that were shared today via chat or in presentations in that document as well. And that will be available on the NAMPAM website, nampan.org. And we'll also have a recording of the session available as well. The only other piece is that once you exit the Zoom session, you should be prompted to take a very short survey about the event. If you're not prompted, you will receive something in your email. Um, and that would it would just be great if you had a few moments to fill it out and it'll help us with um, future events similar to these. But with that, I'll, um, yeah, end us here. And thank you all so much again for joining us today.